It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Premier tripled down, I guess, on his decision to interfere in our judicial appointments process. Uh, he described an epidemic of crime happening on his government's watch. His solution? Appointing Conservative insiders to the committee that appoints judges. So, Speaker, Ontarians don't want an American-style partisan judiciary. They do not Order. want judges picked because they are, quote, like-minded with a government that is under criminal investigation by the RCMP. They just want a system that works. So, Speaker, to the Premier, will the Premier rescind these appointments and start reversing the damage that his neglect has had on access to justice in this province. To respond, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to double down. I'm not going to triple down. I'm going to quadruple down to make sure that we keep these violent criminals that they go to jail. Mr. Speaker, we have the greatest police officers anywhere in the world, right here in the province. They arrest criminals for doing heinous crimes. And guess what happens? The judges let them out on bail to do more heinous crimes the next day. They're kicking in doors in the middle of the night, putting guns Order. to people's heads, scaring their children, scaring the families, Order. scaring neighbourhoods. Where are the rights of the people of this province? Why are you always supporting the criminals? Mr. Speaker, let me give you—we know the Liberals and NDP, they are tough on crime. They want these criminals out. Let me give you some headlines. Court grants bail for alleged gunmen of five victims. Teacher charged with sex offenses released on Response. bail after weekend in jail. Woman charged with manslaughter released on bail. Southern Ontario man charged with forcible confinement, drug trafficking granted on bail. People breaking into homes. The Premier will take his seat. South will come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The Premier will come to order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, I've got a headline for them. How about RCMP investigates Ontario Conservative government? Appointed chair of the Judicial Appointments Committee is a registered lobbyist who lobbied the government as recently as last week. Among their clients, American gun manufacturers. Yesterday, the Attorney General seemed to say this was all business as usual, and I have to say, unfortunately, I don't disagree, because under this government, business as usual means insiders, donors, people with access come first every single time. So, Order. Speaker, back to the Premier. Will he rescind these appointments now, or do we have to wait another month for him to backpedal on this latest scandal? Order. The Premier. Speaker, we have a duty to protect the people. Yeah. We have a duty to protect the students here, here, the people right in this legislature. You ask them. Are they, do they approve of letting these criminals out after committing heinous crimes, terrorizing neighborhoods, running around with guns like it's the Wild Order. West? No, they don't support it. I'll guarantee you they don't support it. The students are so terrified, they don't even want to stay at home without their parents because they're worried about these gun bangers, these, these gun people coming in, shooting up the streets, kicking their doors in putting guns to a woman's head, saying, I'm going to blow your brains out if you don't give me the keys to your car. How do you think that feels? Or the child that was so scared ran outside and jumped in the car when the criminals were taking it. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? The Liberals and their NDP, they're OK Response. with these criminals. Let them out. Let's committing crimes. Let them keep going. You guys are so weak, it makes me sick. Yeah. 
Premier will take his seat. Premier will take his seat. Final supplementary. This Premier refuses again to take accountability and responsibility for anything. Our court system is collapsing, and he's blaming the judges. The government spent a Order. billion dollars on a new Toronto courthouse. This is going sideways fast. And I would remind all members the speaker needs to hear the question. The, the, the speaker needs to hear the response. Interjections are out of order. And members should make their comments through the chair. And I had to interrupt the leader of the opposition. I apologize. Start the clock. Leave the opposition as the floor. Thank you, Speaker. I'll start again. Our court system is collapsing, and he is blaming judges. The government spent a billion dollars on a new Toronto courthouse only to have it dubbed a monument to failure. Courtrooms are forced to close every single day in this province because of understaffing. Their chronic underfunding means that people never get their day in court, and it means that victims, Order. victims will continue to be forced to watch their assailants walk free under this government. Question. So, Speaker, will the Premier finally take responsibility, or will he continue to look for scapegoats for his own failures? Members will take their seats. Reply for the government, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, I hear the public sometimes say politicians are all the same, but here is a stark contrast. If the leader of the opposition had clue one how the system worked, Mr. Speaker, then she would understand that we don't cherry pick judges. There's a committee that makes recommendations, Mr. Speaker. There are judges that sit on the committee, Mr. Speaker. No, Order. you know what, Mr. Speaker? Never mind all that. Never mind all that. They want to defund the police. Yep. They want to tie the hands of the judges with all sorts of crazy notions that their federal cousins are helping Justin Trudeau do what he's doing. Yeah. They run the criminal code. You want to talk about tough on crime, Mr. Speaker? Their federal cousins could be helping us, but they won't. They're moving the other stand direction. The We're going to stand up. Here, here. We're going to stand up for the average citizen, Mr. Speaker. And I hope she asks me another question. There is. An opportunity for another question. The next question, back to the leader of the opposition. Well, Speaker, thank you, Speaker. The scandals never end. Today, we learned about yet another sole source contract handed over to an international company by this government. PricewaterhouseCoopers received more than $26 million to develop Order. software for a digital tribunal system without competing with any software companies, let alone Ontario software companies. It seems the government hasn't learned anything or maybe simply doesn't care about fairness or transparency. So to the Premier, why was a multinational accounting firm with little to no experience with software development handed this contract without having to compete? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I thought she didn't know anything about the justice system. Now she doesn't know anything about the IT system, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I, I, I have the, the member. Yeah, the member. The member doesn't know anything about the IT world, Mr. Speaker. Back in April of 2020, actually before that, I sat down with the NDP government in British Columbia because their court digital uh, system is renowned, Mr. Speaker. And I sat down with Minister Ebby at the time, and he's now Premier Ebby, and said. I hear about this fantastic system, and he said, we would love to share it, Mr. Speaker. We, we would love to share it, and we will give it to you for nothing as long as you adapt it to your market and then share the enhancements, Mr. Speaker. I've talked about this in speeches. I've talked about this in, in the House, Mr. Speaker, but 
you know, I just like I said before, until somebody wrote about it in the paper, they're not paying attention. It's in the estimates. It's it's in Hansard half a dozen Response. times, Mr. Speaker. I, I'm happy to explain more, but I'm glad they're now joining the discussion. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. This sole source contract with uh, PwC was originally signed for less than a million dollars, but now, just three years later, the contract has ballooned to over 26 million. This government has been unable to justify this massive increase. No competition, no transparency again. Despite what the government members say, Ministry and tribunal staff say timelines and milestones are repeatedly delayed and the costs, they just keep growing. So to the Premier, can you explain why you've let the costs balloon to over $26 million when they cannot seem to get the job done? To reply, the Attorney, Attorney General. Hey, Mr. Speaker, this is what happens when you do your fact check through a newspaper report. They misread the estimates. It was never a million and a half dollars, ever. And so I'd love to see what it is you're relying on, unless it's strictly the newspaper article that you read. Please share where that million and a half came from. It's categorically wrong. Now, Mr. Speaker, what is true and what Tribunals is saying is that we had a crisis because the Liberals left us a system that was failing. When we came in, we had this failing system, Mr. Speaker. That's why we looked around the country, Order. went to BC, had a conversation so that we could have something that works for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Now, I'm, I'm happy to send over a letter. This is not a prop. I'll send it to the Leader of the Opposition, wherein Minister Ebby says exactly what I was saying, that they would share for free. Minister Ebby says you have two paths. You can go with PWC, which we recommend. It'll be faster. Or you can go the longer way around, because they have success in BC, Mr. Speaker. So what's the choice? Let the system fail, let Ontarians fail, or go with a proven track? Stop the clock. It's the Speaker who decides what's a prop and what isn't. And, and use that as a prop. Please, please don't do so again. And I'd remind members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. The final supplementary. Speaker, <laughs> Speaker, the long way around, like, I don't know, having a fair process or giving Ontario companies a shot at a contract? <laughs> people, are, people are not getting justice at the landlord and tenant board. They've been plagued with delays since this government came into office six long years ago. They are now more than 38,000 people waiting for their cases to be heard. People are waiting months and sometimes years for their hearing to be even scheduled. And while Ontarians are stuck in this chaos, this government's solution is to hand out more multi-million dollar contracts to their insider friends and giant corporations. So one more time to the Premier, and I'm going to make it simple. Why was only one company considered for this contract, and why is it Question. 26 times more expensive today than it was when it was signed? And to reply, the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, this false narrative about an increase is nonsense, so I won't go into that anymore, but I'm not going to take business lessons. General to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Withdraw? Conclude his answer. I will not take any lessons from, from the NDP in terms of how business is run, Mr. Speaker. This is, a, this is not a company with two men in the basement of a cottage. This is a company that's been in Canada over 100 years. They have an entire justice division within the company, and they have a track record by building the BC product, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, this, this disingenuous, if I can use that word, am I like can't. You can't use that word. You're going to have to withdraw it. I withdraw it. This... Yeah. You're trying to use words that the NDP will understand, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to caution the Attorney General. I'm going to move on to the next question. The member for Kiwetno. Speaker, uh, jurisdiction of health care for First Nations people doesn't end when you step off reserve. That's right. On uh, January 24, leadership of Nistabeg Aski Nation 
held an emergency meeting with, on uh, mental health and addictions. All levels of government were invited, and the leadership uh, from NAN were very disappointed when no one showed up from the, uh, none of the Ontario ministers showed up for the meeting. Can this, can this government let the people know why they didn't show up for the emergency meeting? Reply to the, the government, Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In subsequent conversations with the Grand Chief of Anishinaabeaski Nation, we have reaffirmed our commitment in a couple of important categories to address the mental health crisis, both in isolated communities and as well for students attending high school uh, in Thunder Bay. Those resources, Mr. Speaker, focus on NAN Hope, a program ran by uh, Kiwetnek Oki Mackinac, uh, an organization uh, widely accepted and, and uh, thought of as, as the right organization to deliver services to students uh, on reserve and transitioning to the big city, Mr. Speaker, as well as mental health resources on the ground in Thunder Bay, additional new funding to support the challenges that they face, Mr. Speaker. That was the right action to take. It dealt uh, on point with the kinds of things that the NAN leadership was asking to be addressed. Response. We were there for those communities. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Supplementary, back to member for two now. Speaker, uh, I would like to thank the government for that funding, but uh, it was peanuts. Speaker, uh, this government has an opportunity to listen to First Nations on health transformation, to be true partners, to treaty partners in health. We cannot continue to operate in crisis, and we don't need to continue to lose our children you know, to preventable deaths by suicide. Speaker, uh, it's not normal to attend funerals for 11-year-olds that have died by suicide. It's not normal, Speaker. Will this government start taking this Nishnabaski Nation health state of emergency seriously? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We do take very seriously the work that we are doing with First Nations throughout the province of Ontario, especially in the north and in the remote communities. In fact, I was present for the announcement in Thunder Bay just two weeks ago, and it wasn't the end of the work we're doing. It's the beginning and a continuation of the collaboration that we've had for a long time. In fact, under the leadership of Premier Ford, this government, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, we're working collaboratively with all First Nations across the province of Ontario. We're making investments in all the communities, as well as utilizing the Addiction Recovery Fund to put 56% of all the beds we've opened in the province in Northern Ontario. And specific investments, $7 million to support land and water-based healing, Batchwana First Nation, Meskegawa, Kasheshwan, Kettle and Sony Point, Goodwater St. Mikan, Tawaki TTN, and the First Nations Horizons Treatment Center. Mr. Speaker, we're also working to provide supports to the youth. With Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Small Business. Our government was elected with a strong mandate to serve the people of this province. We know that carbon tax adversely affects businesses and economy and makes life more expensive for Ontarians. That's why our Premier recently introduced legislation, if passed, guarantees that no provincial government can force a carbon tax on the people of Ontario without their say. Small businesses in my community of Richmond Hill were thrilled to hear our government stand up for Ontarians and prioritize keeping costs down for families and businesses. They want to continue to lead by example and fight the carbon tax.
Speaker, can the Associate Question. Minister tell us what is the legislation will mean for small businesses? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the great member from Richmond Hill for the question and for her great advocacy for the businesses in her riding. Since day one, Speaker, this Premier and our government has fought back against the carbon tax. Speaker, it's because we know that for so many households, more tax means less money to spend at their local small businesses. And for so many entrepreneurs, more tax means less money to invest in their businesses or hiring staff. Speaker, while the Ontario Liberals and NDP have stayed silent as their friends in Ottawa plan to increase the carbon tax by over 37 cents per litre, our government is working to guarantee that no provincial government can force a costly carbon tax on the people Response. of Ontario without ensuring their voices are heard loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. Speaker, the costly carbon tax has taken a toll on families and small businesses in Richmond Hill and across the province. According to the Parliamentary Budget Officer, by 2030, Ontarians will experience a decline in the quality of life due to additional costs resulting from carbon tax. With an estimated financial cost of 2000 per household, individuals and families who are already struggling to make their ends meet will experience further hardship. While the NTP and the Liberals continue to believe that increasing taxes is a solution, our government knows that the carbon tax is unfair to the hard-working Ontarians. Speaker, through you to the Associate Minister, what are the small businesses saying about the impact of carbon tax on the business and their communities? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the member for the question. Speaker, let me tell you what I'm hearing from businesses around the province. And this is a quote from a small manufacturer. The carbon tax increasing each year is crippling our ability to do business outside of our local area. We used to have a large province-wide presence with some of our projects in major retailer and online delivery, but now shipping costs are too high to make a profit doing that. Speaker, I've stood in this House and raised the fact that the federal government still hasn't returned the millions of dollars owed to small businesses in rebates. So, Speaker, once again, we're calling on the opposition, NDP and Liberals, to pick up the phone, call their federal counterparts and start supporting and advocating for their businesses and job creators in their writings. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Conservatives came up with a definition of affordable housing in order to spur the construction of affordable homes 18 months ago. 18 months later, the law is still not in force. The government still can't make up their mind on what exact definition of affordable housing they're going to use, and not a single home has been built under this new initiative. Ontario is in a homelessness crisis and a housing affordability crisis, and given that, why is this government taking so long to get this affordable housing initiative off the ground? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The member, of course, will know that uh, her party was supportive. <laughs> In fact, the House unanimously supported the definition of affordable housing that was passed by, uh, by this government. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing uh, a tremendous growth across the province when it comes to purpose-built rentals. We are at the highest level in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker. We had the unfortunate thing yesterday, of course, where the NDP doubled down on wanting us to tax those very same homes that she is wanting, the member across is wanting us to build. They want us to put on a development charge back on those. And we heard, we heard from Habitat for Humanity, and we've heard from a lot of other affordable housing builders across the province of Ontario that the removal of taxes is what is spurring on the development of affordable housing across the province of Ontario. 
Well, we want to build all types of housing, Mr. Speaker. We want to build all types of housing because the dream of home ownership is something that not only should just be a dream, it is something that should be a reality for the people of the province of Ontario. And because Response. of the policies of this government, that is the reality for hundreds of thousands of people, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do that hard work. <laughs> Supplementary question, member for University of Rosedale. Looks like affordable housing is a little bit too hard, so let's try attainable housing. 18 months ago, the Conservatives said they'd come up with an exact definition of attainable housing in order to spur the construction of attainable homes. 18 months later, and the law is still not in force, the government still cannot decide what the definition of attainable is going to be, and not one home has been built under this new program either. Why on earth is it taking the government so long to get these programs off the ground. Members, please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's just the opposite, actually. We're seeing the largest number of, uh, of homes being built across the province of Ontario. We're seeing year after year those numbers increasing, more, more purpose-built rentals, more shovels in the ground than at any other time in the province's uh, history, Mr. Speaker. So I would invite the member to actually look at the stats. But uh, I'm more encouraged by one thing. I just want to stray for a second, if I can, colleagues, and I wanted to thank Colin DeMello for his incredible reporting. I'm going to quote directly from Colin DeMello, and I want to thank the member opposite for her support. We're seeing that in Ottawa, 1,200 new long-term care homes were, uh, were built. In Markham, 320 new homes in Markham, 256 uh, in Burlington, 192 new long-term care homes in Ajax, 256 in Peterborough. 288 uh, new homes in Belleville, 224 in Clarendon, 416 in Stouffville, my hometown, Mr. Speaker, 160 in North Bay, 160 in Sarnia, and you know who's against that? The leader of the Liberal Party who said that they're not homes, Mr. Speaker. That's shameful, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to build homes for all Ontarians. The next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. The previous Liberal government was a disaster for Ontario's economy. Their agenda of high taxes and burdensome red tape shuttered businesses. We saw their most talented workers flee south of the border and blocked new job-creating investments. Thankfully, the days of Liberals neglecting our economy are over. Our government has created the conditions for businesses to succeed, and as a result, good-paying jobs are being created across Ontario. Speaker, can the minister provide us with an update on any recent developments that are helping to create good-paying jobs for the hard-working people of Ontario? Here, here. Mr. Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, of course, I am going to start off with the fact that I have been starting off with almost every day that in 2023, Ontario created more manufacturing jobs than all 50 U.S. states combined. We cannot say that enough in this legislature. That is a sign, Speaker, that our auto plan is working. Think about when we uh, attracted Nexstar from Korea into Windsor. They built a five billion, they're currently building a $5 billion battery plant, and at that time we said there would be a lot of follow-on investment. Well, here's one, a company, Bobeck. They have invested $35 million in a brand new plant across the street in Windsor that does battery insulation panels and other parts for electric vehicles. They are putting 144 people to work there. And Bobeck is already planning their phase two, which is a, a twin building next door. Speaker, it's because we lowered the cost of doing business by $8 billion. Supplementary question. I thank the minister for that answer. It's great to hear about Bobeck's new facility, which will create good-paying jobs for my constituents in, in the county of Essex. When the Liberals were in office, they were content with seeing new auto investments land in foreign jurisdictions, while Ontario's auto, se auto sector stagnated. They didn't believe in Ontario auto workers and firms. 
had what it had what it takes to compete in the global economy. Unlike them, we believe in the hardworking men and women who power our economy and the firms who continue to provide Ontario with a competitive advantage. The contrast between our approach to economic development and the Liberals' failed approach could not be clearer. Speaker, can the minister highlight how, by fostering the conditions for businesses to succeed, our government Question. has enabled the revitalization of our auto sector. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, it's always important to remember where we were. To the students who are here, under the previous government, we lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. Since Premier Ford was elected, we have seen 700,000 men and women go back to work. You know, it was only a few years ago that Reuters announced there would be $300 billion spent in electric vehicles around the world, and zero of it was coming to Canada. Zero. And now here we are, three years later, $28 billion, $28 billion in electric vehicles has landed in our province, putting men and women to work every single day. Bloomberg has now said that Canada is the number one jurisdiction around the world for around the world for electric vehicle parts. Response. That is where we are. We have dethroned China from the number one position for the very first time. That's what's happening in the Thank province. You. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On Eglinton Avenue East in Scarborough, 10 to 12 sections of brand new sidewalk were just dug up because of deficiencies in the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. Speaker, this happened a year after the Sloan Station on this platform's project was jackhammered and carried away in pieces. We're going into the 13th year of this project, Speaker, three years late, a billion dollars over budget. And that is the record of Metrolinx and Phil Verster, its million-dollar CEO. They don't build transit, they break it. They don't finish projects, they extend them. So, Speaker to the Premier, when will this government hold Mr. Verster and Metrolinx accountable? Minister of Transportation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're making the largest investment in public transit in the entire world, Mr. Speaker, 70 billion plus over the next 10 years. Well, let's look at the record of the previous Liberal government and the NDP voting against every single Order. one of these investments, Mr. Speaker. Bridges. Building upside down Order. bridges, stopping highways from being built, stopping governments from investing in public transit. Mr. Speaker, that member has voted against every measure this government has taken to improve public transit in this province. Not only does he support the largest carbon tax in, in Ontario, over 35 cents? He doesn't want anybody to ride on public transit, Mr. Speaker. He's voting against projects like the Ontario Line. He's voting against projects uh, like the Scarborough Subway Extension, Mr. Speaker. Our government will continue to commit to building the largest Response. expansion of public transit in, this, in the world. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, back to the minister, I suppose. The people of Scarborough just got their answer today. They can see with their own eyes on Eglinton Avenue pieces of brand new sidewalk being carried away in dump trucks. A waste of money. Just like the people living near Sloan Station saw the platform carried away in dump trucks again. Another waste of money. But under this government's watch, Speaker, they can't blame anybody else. In 2020, the Auditor General told them that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT was being built at risk. Built at risk. Metrolinx, Phil Verster, and their P3 buddies carried on despite that risk, and now we have at least 260 deficiencies in this project that this government will not answer for. Will not answer for. So, Speaker, when will this government do what a competent government would do? Fire Phil Verster. Signal that you demand change for the hardworking taxpayers of this province. Tell the people of Scarborough, tell the people of Toronto that a new day is coming. We're going to build and not break public transit. Great solution. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 
In the previous Liberal government, supported by NDP, Scarborough was a forgotten part of the city of Toronto. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford, after 30 years of inaction, we are building Scarborough Subway, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, shovel is in the ground for Ontario Line, shovel is in the ground for Scarborough Subway. Mr. Speaker, Premier Ford made one fair possible. NDP and Liberal voted against one fair, not just once, Mr. Speaker, they voted against one fair, $1,600 savings twice. Oh. Wow. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Why do you appoint a gun lobbyist to chair the panel that chooses our judges? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, we appointed a very accomplished individual with a deep knowledge of how government works, with a deep knowledge of how various sectors work, Mr. Speaker. We also appointed an individual who has complied with all of the rules and regulations, with the integrity commissioner, with other, somebody who plays above board, Mr. Speaker. That's the kind of person that we appointed, and he happens to be registered with a particular company, Mr. Speaker. It's not because. Order. Mr. Speaker, Order. the Liberals laugh. The Liberals laugh. You know what I laugh at, Mr. Speaker? Is their feigned oh, indignation, Mr. Speaker. It is unbelievable, given their track record, that they even comment on this stuff. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. I take this to heart. I'm coming from a community in Scarborough that is deeply impacted by gun violence. Don't we matter? In my campaigning, I went to apartment buildings that I spoke to parents that have suffered because they have lost their 19 year old, their 18 year old, their 17 year old. There are students who have been impacted in their schools over gun violence. To the Premier, don't the people of Scarborough matter? to you. My question to you again is, why do you appoint a lobbyist to chair the panel that chooses our judges? We matter. I'll remind the members, remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor. The Premier. You know something? I agree. Everyone matters. But why don't you support us on making sure we appoint tough judges to keep these criminals in jail until the young people that I've been out to Scarborough a thousand times, not a hundred, a thousand times, supporting your community. And do you know what the mothers say? Throw these criminals in jail. That's what the mothers are telling me. They're telling me the same thing in Scarborough as they're telling me in Etobicoke North. They want, they want to make sure their kids can walk to school peacefully. They want to make sure their kids can go to the park, even at nighttime, without getting a gun pointed to their head, and the judge lets them out the next day, and that same criminal's in the park, stealing drugs, putting guns to people's heads, robbing people, and guess what? He, he gets bail again. He doesn't get bail once. He doesn't get it twice. He's been out on bail eight times. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. Member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas will come to order. Member for Ottawa South will come to order.
Let's start the clock and start again. Member for Markham Thornhill. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Ontario population is growing rapidly. As we continue to build our province, the transportation infrastructure also needs to be expanded. The constituent in my riding, Markham Thornhill, want more transit, highway, and roads. Because of Speaker, thank you to the 15 years of liberal inaction, communities are in infrastructure deficit. The Liberal failed to build vital transportation network to keep up with our growing population and expanding business needs. Our government must continue to implement solutions that would improve transportation for families and businesses. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us this house how our government is ensuring we build infrastructure faster to strengthen our transit network? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for highlighting such an important issue. For 15 years, Mr. Speaker, the previous Liberal government did absolutely nothing, didn't build highways, didn't build transit, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they built upside-down bridges, Mr. Speaker. And then what did they do? Their current leader led the charge against building Highway 413, Mr. Speaker, important projects that this province needs. And then what happens two weeks ago? The federal minister of environment, her friend, says they're not going to invest in any more roads and bridges across this province. Mr. Speaker, they are so out of touch. But thanks to advocacy for members like that member for Mark and Thornhill, we're going to make sure we invest in communities like Marco. We're going to make sure we build transit. We're going to make sure we invest in highways like Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass, because that is what the people of this province elected us to do. It's about making sure we save 30 minutes each trip on the 413, so they can spend, you can spend Response. more time with your families at home instead of being in gridlock, Mr. Speaker. It's about time the Liberals and the NDP wake up and look at the challenges people are facing in their Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that great response. It is really encouraging to see Ontario lead the country on infrastructure investment. We are sending the clear message that transit infrastructure is a priority for this government. Mr. Speaker, our Premier once said, there is no better place in the world to invest and raise family than here in Ontario. Absolutely. To ensure we remain the best place in the world for families, we must continue to keep costs down. The people of our province expect that their government will continue to look for ways to make life easier and more affordable. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Get It Done Act will deliver the true affordability and put more money back into the people's pocket? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government has been working since day one to make sure we keep life affordable for the residents of this province and our families. So, Mr. Speaker, the previous Liberal government, uh, supported by the NDP, raised taxes, uh, tolls, license fees on the hardworking people of this province, and our government has been committed to making sure we reduce tolls. We take the tolls off highways, Mr. Speaker, that we freeze license fees. And, Mr. Speaker, no one will be able to implement a carbon tax in this province unless they take it to the people, Mr. Speaker. I gave the example of a truck driver yesterday. Fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a carbon tax cost a trucker's family, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals have supported the carbon tax every step of the way. That's fifteen thousand dollars that could be going towards their own family, Mr. Speaker. Order. The carbon tax has Spons. increased costs on absolutely everything in this mm. province, Mr. Speaker. We, as a government, will continue to fight for the hardworking people of this province, keep costs low. Thank you. <laughs> member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. Next question, member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Families from Ola Daycare in my riding are in the House today. They are facing an $800 to $900 per child increase in the cost of their childcare because the operator had to withdraw from the $10 a day childcare program due to this Conservative government's poor implementation. Okay. It's been two years since the agreement was signed with the federal government, and Ontario still does not have a funding formula in place. Childcare centres simply cannot operate with this kind of unpredictability. 
Where is the funding formula you promised? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first of all, this is the government that cut child care fees for those families by 50 per cent, saving them eight to ten thousand dollars a year. For context, under the former Liberals, child care increased by 400 per cent, and under their leadership, under the Liberal leadership, child care became the city of Toronto was a child care desert. We have a commitment to build 19 thousand net new spaces between now and year 2026, and we are on track to do it. Now, Mr. Speaker, you raise a, a serious concern about the federal program, a concern we share. The difference is when it came to voting in this House to stand up for for-profit operators like those in your riding, you opted to side with the federal Liberal government to preclude a third of our parents who are here today who want government on their side and off their back. Instead of Bots. trying to speak from both sides of your mouth, vote for choice, respect families, support all Stop the clock. Two things. I'll remind the members once again. Please make your comments through the chair. Secondly, I'm going to ask the Minister of Education to withdraw his unparliamentary remark. I withdraw. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, the general operating funding to childcare programs, which is a provincial responsibility, is lower this year than it was in 2018, even before adjusting for record high inflation. Without dependable operating funding that increases with cost of living and without immediate action, more families like the ones with us today will be without affordable childcare. Families from Ola Daycare have been left scrambling. Their choice is to pay hundreds of dollars more each month or lose their childcare spot. Will the minister commit to, at the very least, Increase funding to keep pace with inflation so operators don't leave the program. And to reply, Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the position of the Liberal Party and that of the New Democrats was to omit all for profit childcare overwhelmingly <coughs> operated by small business women. You would have literally removed the choice of government to provide support and a 50 per cent reduction to those families. We are the only political party in this House that did what the Liberals could never have done, which is cut fees, increase spaces, and stand up for the choices of all families in this province. Those are the facts. And so, while we increase wages for workers, we're going to continue cutting fees for working families. What we're not going to do is, is allow ideology to triumph over the right of all families to have choice and affordable childcare, because the Liberals and New Democrats would have precluded them all. Mr. Speaker, we are going to remain focused on affordability during this national crisis Response. by cutting fees, creating more spaces, and supporting all families in all regions of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Premier boasted last week that the funding for post-secondary education announced on Monday would be, quote, fabulous. It's not fabulous, it's famine. The funding just proposes less than half of what the government's own blue ribbon panel recommended. In turn, that recommendation, under a mandate to be fiscally responsible, only partly restored what this government has allowed to erode away with inflation. On Monday, the minister was repeatedly asked how her fabulous announcement was even an adequate response to her own blue ribbon panel. The minister fell back on blaming Ottawa for her government's mismanagement, and then we learned yesterday that they did not attend meetings with their federal Order. counterparts. Mr. Speaker, when will they get it done right and deliver adequate funding for Ontario colleges and universities? The Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I will take no advice from that member of the Liberal Party on post-secondary education in this province. In fact, under the leadership of the, lead, the Liberal government, tuition rose to the highest in Canada. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, we decreased tuition by 10 per cent, and it remained frozen. We announced just the other day, and it, we are continuing to freeze tuition in this province. We are making 
post-secondary affordable for students in this province. Mr. Speaker, I announced a historic investment, $1.3 billion, the largest investment in post-secondary education in more than a decade. We will ensure that our institutions have the stability and the predictability and not on the backs of Ontario students. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this Premier likes to say he's for the people. We know he's for his friends. Recently, we learned that the, the PCs and the Minister of Colleges and Universities have been hosting over the last few years fundraisers attended by many officials of for-profit private career colleges that have boomed under this government. A month ago, only after the federal government took the drastic step of capping international student visas, did this government put a moratorium on new public-private partnerships and begin a review of international student programs. Programs. Why did the Conservative government hold back and let the situation get so completely out of hand? When they're under criminal investigation by the RCMP for the Greenbelt scandal, how can we take seriously the Premier's words at a news conference that, quote, no one can influence our government, no one can influence any minister at all? And again to respond, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government is for the people and for the students, and we have proven that. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, while well, this Premier freezes tuition, the leader of the Liberal Party wants to hike tuition. We are ensuring that tuition is affordable for every student in Order. this province. Mr. Speaker, there is an affordability crisis. The price the price to heat, to eat, to rent. We are going to ensure that every student has access to affordable post-secondary education in this province. Mr. Speaker, we made a historic announcement, $1.3 billion to ensure sustainability and predictability for our institutions in this province. Here, here. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Whitby. Well, thank you, Speaker. The, my question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Ontario Speaker is experiencing a generational labour shortage that, if left undressed, will result in billions of dollars in lost productivity. According to the latest Job Vacancy Wage Survey, there are an estimated 237,000 unfilled positions in the province. Speaker, that's exactly why we must continue to demonstrate leadership and help get more people into rewarding careers. Our government must remain steadfast in its commitment to positioning Ontario as the premier destination for both workers and businesses to thrive. Speaker, can the minister outline what steps our government is taking to alleviate the labour shortage and propel Ontario to reach its full economic potential? Great question. Mr. Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, you know, today I was at Centennial uh, College for Jill of All Trades event with the Premier and a number of, of my colleagues, and a trades teacher approached me and said, you know what, David, I'm really motivated to train a next generation. And you know why? Because he was symbolic of the challenge we're facing. One in three tradesmen and women are 55 or older. To build the hospitals, the schools, the highways we so desperately need, it's going to require men and women in the trades. And we were empowered with that room full of inspiring young women. Women like Carmen. Carmen. Carmen, who works for the TTC, Carmen was told by a big burly guy, you're too small to work as a mechanic. Well, guess what? She is one today. She's kicking ass, speaker. And and, and Speaker, guess what that guy said to her? He now asked her, how do I get into the trades? Well, thanks to our government, Thoughts. we're breaking down barriers, getting more youth into the trades so we can build the things we need. I'm going to caution the member on his choice of words, the minister rather, the um, supplementary question. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. Our government understands that each missed paycheck not only impacts individual workers, but also represents a lost opportunity for families to improve their quality of life. To ensure Ontario remains the best place to live, work, and yes, raise a family, it's critical for our government to support employers in finding the skilled workers they need 
to grow their businesses and our economy. We must also continue our ongoing efforts to attract, support, and protect workers so that they can reach their full potential in the workplace. Here, here. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government is securing better jobs with bigger paychecks for hardworking workers and those who are seeking employment opportunities in our great province? Great question. Minister of Labour, Innovation, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. And, Speaker, I'm proud to rise to talk about a fund, a fund that sadly the opposition voted against, the Skills Development Fund. It's over a billion dollars, Speaker, and it's helped train half a million Ontarians. And, Speaker, let me tell you two quick stories. One, Shanika. I met her at the Newcomer Centre in downtown Toronto. She talked about purpose driven careers thanks to work this government is doing, supporting Sarah Asalia and the team there with the Skills Development Fund um, investment. Thanks to that speaker, she's gotten out of dead-end jobs. She's now got purpose in her life because we're lifting her up, something opposition would never do. Speaker, another story, Phil Fournier, Ironworker 759, again, working dead-end cash jobs, not paying taxes, now a contributing member of the North. He's inspiring. He's training a next generation of ironworkers. He's joined the union up there, again, thanks to Skills Development Fund. Speaker, this government's going to continue investing in the skilled trades because we're actually building things. After decades of neglect, we're getting it done for highways, roads, bridges, you name it. We're getting it done and training. Thank you. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The region of Durham is one of the fastest growing communities in Canada. New neighbours are joining us every single day, and we need the health care infrastructure to support them. Durham needs a new hospital, and we are ready to go, with a proposed site in Whitby selected by an expert panel two years ago. So for two years, families have been left waiting for hours at our overburdened care centres. Seven MPPs represent the Durham region. Six of them are government members. I support a new Durham hospital. So, Minister, do you agree that Durham needs a new hospital? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to hear that the member in the opposition is actually talking about investments in our health care system. Uh, it is disappointing to suggest that the 50-plus hospital capital builds that we already have in the system have been voted against mm -hmm. consistently every time we have a budget, every time we have es estimates, the member opposite votes against those. So I would hope that as the process continues with the new Whitby Hospital, and I have to say, you know, there is not a day that the member from Whitby so does not talk about and give me an update on what is happening in his community. And the other Durham members, you know, as all of us are, we are very excited about the capital builds that are happening in our hospital systems across Ontario. I am very seized with the Whitby Hospital in Response. particular, and know that with the members' opposite support, I hope that you vote for it when yeah, it comes yeah. forward. Yeah. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Durham Region needs a new hospital. The proposed site is in Whitby, and their new hospital campaign is catching like wildfire, understandably. A new Durham hospital means less stress on the rest of our health care system and on the Oshawa Hospital, and it means better care across Durham. The last couple budgets, we have not seen planning grants, so, Minister, all we need to get started is a planning grant. Will it be approved, and when can we expect it? Thank you. Minister of Health. Again, $50 billion has been set aside for over 50 hospital capital new expansion and renovation projects in the province of Ontario. You know, we understand that the need as Ontario's population ages, as Ontario's population increases, we are there as a government, whether it is expanding health human resources, seats in colleges and universities, whether it is directing and making sure that people who want to practice in the province of Ontario have a seamless pathway to do that, whether it is an expansion of the North Durham Family Health Team that we announced two weeks ago. I trust that while the member advocates for her region, she keeps in mind that every time she votes against these projects, she is suggesting to her community that they are not worthy. Here, here. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care. Oh, great minister. All seniors in Ontario deserve access to the care and support they need, when they need it. Despite numerous calls from experts and advocates, the previous Liberal government failed uh. to acknowledge the critical importance of investing in long-term care facilities and services. Now, in contrast, our government has made record investments in building and redeveloping long-term care homes across this great province. But, Speaker, with Ontario se seniors entering long-term care homes later than ever before and often with more medically complex care needs, we must Question. ensure that all residents receive safe, quality care. Speaker. Can the minister please tell the House what our government is doing to support long-term care homes and connect long-term care residents to more convenient care? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, you know, I'm sure that hardworking member uh, will agree with me when I say that we don't always see eye to eye with the NDP and the Green Party over there. But I was glad, Speaker, to hear over the weekend that the NDP agrees, that the Green Party agrees, that long-term care homes are indeed homes. Well, Speaker, that just leaves one party in this legislature that doesn't seem to get that picture. And I guess it's no surprise, right, Speaker? Because the Liberals, when they were in power for the better part of two decades, well, they made a goal. They said they were going to build 35,000 long-term care spaces, an admirable goal. I think that was in 2007. But, Speaker, you know what happened when they exited government in 2018? They had built a net new 611. So it's no wonder, I suppose, the Liberals don't want to consider these homes homes because they failed miserably to actually build them. This Premier Speaker is getting it done with a record investment in capital and the Health Human Resort. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It is great to hear about our government's continued effort in delivering safe, quality care for our elderly loved ones. Speaker, people with cognitive conditions like dementia often require more specialized care in long-term care homes. They often face more challenges in being connected to long-term care services. Our government must do all that we can to provide people with complex needs the care they need and deserve in the comfort of a home instead of a hospital. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House what other steps our government is taking to ensure seniors get the care they need Question. in order to live comfortably and with dignity? Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, there's a lot to list here. I wish I had an extra 19 seconds uh, just to list those. Uh, but speaker, just speaking of the be uh, behavioral specialized units, $5.5 million investment announced just uh, uh, recently for three BSUs in homes in Brampton, Timmins, and Etobicoke. This is the game-changing investment that we need for our seniors. It's not just about capital, which we are investing to record levels. It's not just about health human resources, which we are investing to record levels. It is about targeted approaches to making sure our seniors get the right care in the right place. Now, Speaker, let's contrast that. We talked about the past record of the Liberal government, but today they have a leader in Bonnie Crombie, somebody who promises to build but fails to deliver and doesn't even consider a long-term care home a home for its residents. Now, I challenge the leader of the Liberal Party and every single one of those Liberal members to walk with me into their ridings, into those homes, and tell those hard-working seniors Response. who built our communities, who gave us our lives as we know it, that they are not living in a home. This government disagrees, Speaker. We're going to continue to invest into those who took care of us. It Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Due to lack of mental health supports in Windsor for children and youth with complex needs, parents are surrendering their children to the Children's Aid Society, hoping much-needed help 
will finally be given. In some cases, the families are being forced to send their kids up the 401 to London or Elsa Craig, where they get put on a wait list for supports. With no foster families to support their complex needs, kids, some as young as six years old, are put in unlicensed placements, a hotel speaker. Some kids will age out before they ever get the help they need. Some kids are being trafficked, and some are being targeted by drug dealers. Speaker, this is a very dire situation in my community and communities around the province. We should not have to send children from Windsor to London or Elsa Craig or anywhere outside our community to get the supports and services they need. It is absolutely despicable. So when will the Premier act to ensure that children and youth with Question. complex needs in Windsor have the mental health supports they need in Windsor? The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for that important question. If she's had an opportunity to read the roadmap to wellness, you'll see that we're building a plan for the province of Ontario and focused on children and youth, focused on adults, focused on seniors. And in the process of doing that, we've invested $525 million annually and will continue to do so. Mr. Speaker, we're focused on children and youth. We know how important it is to invest in the children and youth to ensure that they Order. get the supports they need so that as adults they can live their lives the way everyone else does. And those investments Order. are being made, whether it be through the pediatric fund that was created, it was just announced by the Premier and the Minister of Health, whether it be through the uh, nearly $500 million that was invested, and we continue to invest in children and youth. There's a lot of work to be done, but we are making progress and we are building a system Response. that is making a difference in the lives of everyone and providing services in each of the areas where people live throughout the province. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Next, we have a deferred vote. <coughs> Is there a point of order? We'll do it after the votes. Um, we have a deferred vote on a motion for closure on the motion for second reading of Bill 165, an act to amend the Ontario Energy Board Act 1998, respecting certain board proceedings and related matters. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.